Hello and welcome to another Ancient Warfare magazine podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. In this episode, we're looking at Ancient Warfare magazine volume 10, issue 2. Wars in Hellenistic Egypt, the Kingdom of the Ptolemies. We have a full team today. I'm joined by Joshua Browers, Murray Darm, Lindsay Powell, Mark McCaffrey, Mark DeSantis and Sean Hoosman. So for those who've not yet picked up their copy of the magazine, and don't forget you can order it from ancient-warfare.com, uh, I wonder if uh, one of you guys could give us a quick overview of Hellenistic Egypt. It, it starts off, of course, with with their, how every uh, how the Hellenistic period starts off in general with the death of Alexander. Um, and when Alexander dies, his entire empire becomes the... the the battleground for all of his generals who believe that they should succeed Alexander and um, one of his generals Ptolemy uh, takes control of Egypt uh, which is probably the most stable uh, he takes control of Egypt and he founds his uh, own dynasty there and um, of all the Hellenistic kingdoms that arise after Alexander's death uh, the Ptolemaic kingdom of Egypt is basically the most stable Hellenistic entity um, that we have because of Egypt's um, isolation uh, thanks to the desert, thanks to the Mediterranean, uh, etc. Um, so he founds this dynasty and it survives um, after the death of Alexander until uh, the Romans arrive um, uh, with uh, Mark Antony and Cleopatra being defeated at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC by uh, Augustus and them uh, committing suicide in 30 BC after which Egypt is turned into a Roman province. And the whole period in between is basically the Ptolemaic Egypt, uh, era of Egypt, um, and that's the the subject of the issue. So, how how did the um, Ptolemies maintain power? I mean, there were foreigners within you know within uh, with uh, within Egypt. Well, that's an interesting question and uh, something that really fascinates me. The way uh, that uh, Ptolemy kept control over Egypt was to assume the role of pharaoh the uh, old uh, Egyptian form of rule. He became a god king, an Egyptian god king. While at the same time, uh, outwardly, toward the rest of the Mediterranean, he kept up the appearance of a Hellenistic monarch. So he was in a strange, uh, ambivalistic double role there. But he's not original in this idea. He's following in the footsteps of Alexander, directly taking on this role and taking on the same policies of... Uh, being totally different to the, the Persians and their rule of Egypt and them being just over-rulers of or foreign rulers, exerting their authority, neglecting the, uh, the traditional cultures of the place. He's Ptolemy's following Alexander and uh, accepting their culture and accepting their traditional structures of government and whatnot. Mm. So it's sort of a combination of assimilation and um, uh, uh, you know, imposition, I suppose. Um, as I understand it, Alexander uh, put very much weight on the intermingling of the cultures. You know, a mixture of Macedonian and Persian uh, culture, while uh, Ptolemy uh, kept uh, the Macedonian elites in Egypt and the uh, uh, native Egyptians more or less apart. But he does mix the uh, the military side of things. He does bring in, like Alexander was sort of doing at the end of his reign, the introduction of native troops into Macedonian units and whatnot. So, okay, not necessarily marrying into the, the aristocracy, but still incorporating the native elements into his society as such. And I think I think the adoption of Egyptian political language, shall we say, um, is how he sort of says i am i am what you're used to even though i'm very different so it's uh to to copy both a, a sitcom and an australian uh, election campaign it is continuity with change and you can you can see this basically if you extend it further back into time if you look at the um uh, the hyksos kings in the second intermediate period or the uh, nubian uh, rulers of egypt in the third intermediate period uh, where they also basically adopt a lot of the egyptian uh, imagery in the Egyptian um, way of expressing uh, the kingship and everything else. Uh, Egypt is a very uh, conservative country um, in ancient times from 
uh, the early stage onwards and you see that whenever there's a foreign invader it's usually more expedient for the the this this dominant force whether it's the the Hyksos in, in upper Egypt in the, in the intermediate second intermediate period or the Nubians or uh, the Persians later or Alexander uh, more expedient to basically adopt the Egyptian way of doing things towards the Egyptian people to make sure that everything continues to run more or less smoothly um, and that's something that Alexander also adopts, uh, like he said, and that is then also inherited by Ptolemy uh, when he has himself depicted on uh, in reliefs like an Egyptian pharaoh, uh, while at the same time also making monuments that have Greek letters instead of hieroglyphics, etc. So it's something that has a long history in, in Egypt, far beyond uh, Alexander already. So a question from Facebook from uh, Rolf. Um, how big was the role of the Greek colonies in uh, in shaping the Ptolemaic, P Ptolemaic forces? Uh, well, they basically adopt the, the Macedonian system. Uh, but already, if you look if you look at late period uh, Egypt, you already see drastic changes in the military makeup of the uh, uh, of the country, and that from the late period onwards, so that's about um, the start of rule of uh, Samtik the first, which is six sixty seven BC, if I recall correctly. Um, he is the first, as Herodotus explains, to hire uh, large numbers of Ionian and Carian mercenaries, so mercenaries from uh, Anatolia's west coast. And that sort of sets a trend where Egypt in the late period starts not using not just using native troops, but also large numbers of uh, essentially foreign mercenaries, although uh, a lot of the Greeks that settle in uh, Naucratis, for example, from the, the 6th century onwards, uh, become very uh, Egyptianized. Uh, there's a, a nice article, um, I think, that I wrote myself, if I can say so, in the uh, <laughs> uh, sample, sample issue of uh, Ancient History magazine, which is available for free download, um, about a uh, sarcophagus here in, in the Leiden Antiquities Museum, uh, which looks completely Egyptian, uh, but the hieroglyphs on the sarcophagus explain that this is a man whose parents were Greek. Um, so that's something that you see already from the 7th century BC onwards in Egypt uh, where the Egyptians use a lot of uh, essentially foreign troops, uh, Greek uh, and, and Anatolian uh, hoplites undoubtedly uh, uh, and other types of troops perhaps also uh, in the armies to fight there. Uh, when the Persians come basically the same sort of thing happens and the Persians also use a lot of mercenaries of course so that when Alexander arrives with his, and he introduces his military system it's probably not as foreign to the Egyptians as uh, you might think even though the, the phalanx would have been something new the Macedonian phalanx and when Ptolemy uh, founds his dynasty he uses like all the other uh, successor kings um, the same system that he that he's familiar with from uh, Alexander and Philip um, and then the the Ptolemaic Egyptian army basically becomes uh, another Hellenistic uh, war machine. The difference is that they do I mean the, the Greek settlements that are established during the early Ptolemies do shift the polit the political scene in Egypt to the the Nile Delta with the ex establishment of Alexandria. So I guess that's maybe what they're sort of he's trying to get at in this question in terms of it's shifting it away from the traditional uh, to something new, something, you know, a, a clear cut uh, foreign aristocrat, uh, aristocracy uh, that's based in its own headquarters and which later on the Ptolemies get a lot of their political support from. And then, you know, ultimately when you get to Cleopatra uh, and her brother Ptolemy the Thirteenth. Ptolemy the Thirteenth supporters are well and truly based in uh, that Alexandria in the north, and then Cleopatra is appealing to her uh, more Egyptian traditional supporter base in the south. Uh, I suppose so it's also that idea of how did the Macedonian uh, army of Ptolemy perpetuate itself? Um, that you know, how did how did it maintain its its uh, Macedonianness? Uh, over over such a long period of time, in terms of you know the the children of soldiers and and soldiers into marrying and and that culture being maintained within within an Egyptian context. Uh, well, on the subject of <coughs> intermarriage, um, we don't have many cases of intermarriage. We know of some cases where uh, Macedonian Greeks took Egyptian wives. But uh, we know of no cases where it's uh, the other way around. 
So uh, we still see a clear uh, hierarchy in the between the native Egyptians and the uh, Macedonian new elites. If it's anything like uh, Seleucus I in terms of his early uh, reign, uh, there's mention there of entire Macedonian settlements being established, you know, pure and simple in terms of veterans and their uh, the wives that they've picked up on the conquest, but, um, you know, being firm recruiting grounds for the army. It kind of leads to another question uh, uh, about... Um was the uh, did the army did they remain as distinct units uh, on, you know on, on national on ethnic backgrounds or were they mixed? Well, I personally uh, I don't believe they were those units were mixed because you know we've got loads of papyri from uh, Ptolemaic times and loads of uh, complaints and petitions by native Egyptians to their Macedonian overlords. And these show a clear uh, separation between Egyptians and Macedonians. And uh, no, I, can't, uh, I can't prove it, but um, I can't imagine that it was any different in the army. I'd imagine you have your, uh, your traditional Macedonian troops, your phalanx, and... Uh, what not, and then you've got Egyptian units. So I don't think they are both mixed, but uh, feel free to correct me. What I want to know for sure, I think they start adopting, I think they start allowing uh, natives to also be recruited into uh, regular forces, but I, I wouldn't be sure. Is it possible, for example, that the command structure was taken over by Macedonian or at least approved Greek uh, trained people and that the rank of file remained Egyptian. I mean, you see examples in history where the conquering forces basically takes over the strategic command and uh, sets the rules and the other ones have to follow them. Yeah, that's, that seems most likely. I mean, I've, I've, I'm just finishing the, uh, the issue on, um, on Mithridates and one of the things, one of the articles there touches upon uh, Pontic imi uh, imitation legions. Uh, which are known from a few uh, ancient writers, and there you see uh, Roman uh, soldiers basically being um, bought by Mithridates to come and teach Armenians and people from the Crimea uh, to fight in the Roman manner. Um, and I think something like that probably also happened in the successor states, but I, I wouldn't be able to, to say positively one way or the other. It seems logical. The modern euphemism, of course, is they're called military advisors these, these days. The United States sends in military advisors, and for all intents and purposes, they're the command. No, but the, the command structure, at least, would have been Macedonian. That, that's almost, I mean, you see that with the, uh, in, in Ptolemaic uh, Egypt anyway, like in all the successor states, basically, that there's a, a large dominant uh, Greek, mostly Macedonian uh, component in the elites, often mixing with uh, the native element. Um, uh, to to create a, a, a sort of workable thing, uh, whereas the, the the mass of the population, of course, is completely uh, not Macedonian. It seems logical that something like that would also happen in the armies. Yeah, I mean, certainly the sources emphasise the ethnic origins of most of the units, especially the mercenary ones, in, in the armies. We get the you get the Macedonian infantry, uh, who are described as just that, uh, and then you get all of these sort of smaller units from other. Um, ethnic areas or, or, or um, states uh, and then you get the idea of the you know the the when the Egyptians are adopted into into the phalanx they're Egyptians trained in phalanx fighting but it would seem as if they are separate the only problem to that is there's a couple of uh, modern historians who beg to differ that the the references to Macedonian troops does that refer refer to Macedonians or to Macedonian style training troops and that you cannot be certain upon. Now I mean already Alexander of course started to incorporate uh, native troops into the army to replenish them. I mean in, in 330 BC he sends away the Greek uh, forces for example, the Greek allies when they reach Ecbatana uh, he tells the, the Greeks basically okay well you know I guess Persia has been defeated so you can all go home now. So he sends them to the coast, uh, Thessalian cavalry and all the, the Greek infantry uh, to be put on boats to go back to uh, Euboea, but he does say, you know, those of you who want to stay here and fight with me, I'm going to give you this much 
gold and silver uh, to do that. But otherwise, you know, your your obligation here is is over. Um, He's already doing that when they're up in Bactria, and possibly possibly even earlier, depending on who you, how you read the sources. Was there a determined effort to try and get uh, Greeks to colonize Egypt, kind of to bolster their position? You mean to sort of uh, ethnically reinforce the uh, their, their elites or something? Or yeah, their uh, power power base. If you want to think of it that way, I think that there probably are determined efforts throughout the period. You know, when each each of the, especially in the immediate uh, Diadochoi period where each one's trying to assert that they are the the true successor um you know i i possess you know as ptolemy who you know kidnapped alexander's body um and took it back to egypt supposedly um that whole idea of i'm i'm the i'm the legitimate successor as a way of attracting more followers um and i think that sort of continues throughout the period it must be a way of perpetuating the you know the, the the Macedonian or Greekness of their of their ruling elite was to attract um, families to come and settle in their city or their their country. But of all of them, I think Ptolemy is probably the most isolationist of all of the Diadochi. So whether you know how much, whereas the others seem to be sort of actively seeking to pick up the the dregs of what's left of Alexander's, you know top troops and whatnot, uh, Ptolemy doesn't seem to be really going out there and making the, the same sort of effort to, to do that recruitment. So from, uh, again, from Stuart, um, during the P- Ptolemaic dynasty, were any improvements made to the army um, compared to the Macedonia Macedonian army from Philip's day? Improvements? <laughs> that's, a, that's a rather laden term. Um it's yeah the the yeah I'm not sure if you can see that separate from what's going on elsewhere in the Hellenistic world basically the uh, developments in the in the uh, uh, in the Ptolemaic I guess improvements actually have really meant changes rather than improvements because you change you know was one of those things it's often cyc- cyclic cyclic cyclical insofar as you know, you're always trying to outgun the other person, and sometimes you get back yeah. to where you start. So it's a, it's a constantly yeah. changing. I think, I think one of the one of, of one of the big issues with the 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 whole Hellenistic period is, of course, they've inherited Alexander's system, uh, and because they are the inheritors of Alexander, what you tend to get is basically an arms race on Macedonian style terms. So so you find that the phalanxes of the uh, the Hellenistic armies just increase in size and they get bigger and bigger and so it's this uh, stagnation because they tend to, tend to fight each other. So therefore it's phalanx versus phalanx and they get bigger and bigger and they adopt more and more um, elephants and more and more things. But there's a sort of a, a stagnation in terms of tactical thinking which of course I think tends to what happens when the phalanx comes into contact with the Roman legions is that they've stagnated for so long they haven't fought anyone else except each other. Um, and then, of course, you do get developments in naval warfare and bizarre sort of experiments, especially in the Tom, you know the Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic army experiments with scythe chariots and other sorts of things. Um, but, yeah, improvements is... Um, yeah, changes... There are not many changes, but I would say. There's a lot of imitation going on as well. I mean, creating your own companion cavalry and, uh, you know, the, the own versions of the bodyguards and whatnot. It, it's not the same training that originated in Macedon. It's not the same system of, uh, of tutelage of uh, peers coming up, so... So do we see the uh, development of the uh, heavy infantrymen more in the Roman style towards the end of this period? Yeah, we do. There is an, uh, an article by um, Matthew Beasley in the issue on the Thracitae, um, which I mentioned by Polybius and a few other ones. Uh, they're similar to, to the Pontic uh, imitation legionaries that I mentioned before. Um, and these pop up throughout the successor kingdoms of the course of the 2nd and the 1st centuries BC. And they uh, mostly they use um, local uh, equipment, so they wear the the Thracian helmets or the Boeotian helmets, uh, from what we can see from from the few uh, figurative uh, 
bits of evidence we have, like reliefs. Um, but they they mostly also have the the characteristics oblong shaped uh, oblong uh, shields like the uh, like the Romans used around this time in the Republic, um, and they they sometimes also have uh, the the Lorica Hamata inspired uh, male shirts. Uh, so we see those kinds of experiments in the Hellenistic armies trying to adopt what works for the Romans for their their own armies. And there's experiments with extra heavy uh, cavalry, like cataphracts and, and stuff like that. So there, there is experimentation going on in the war elephants, as you already mentioned. But again, that's continuing trends started by Alexander. I mean, in terms of the phalangites, they were a mi- mixture of, you know, by the end of Alexander's reign, they were a mixture of the original heavy infantry, but now able to be equipped at times with the lighter stuff and actually work, you know, more in smaller, more mobile units and whatnot. And then the, in terms of the cataphracts, cataphracts, uh, sorry, cataphract cavalry are uh, operating in different levels by, in the successor period in different armies across different areas of former Alexander's em- empire. Why were they not as successful as uh, using them as, say, the Romans? They weren't using them on the same scale, as far as I know. That, that's usually the idea. They, they, they form these uh, sort of... I'm, I'm not even sure if, they, if you would call them elite units, but they're they're not the dominant force. I mean, the dominant uh, units, as far as I can tell, uh, were still um, the the regular uh, pike phalanxes. Yeah. Well, well, I think I think I think it's like so many of the other units you get described. They are a unit who are equipped as Roman legionaries were, but they're not they're not the the mainstay of the force. They're a uh, uh, you know, they've sort of become like a polyglot army of different, you know, silver shields and, and uh, as you said before, sort of these imitation. Um, and they're not perfect imitations they're either. I mean, they're they're not. I mean, it's it's not it's not like they're completely dressed like you know Roman uh, Republican legionaries or something. It's it's they're, they're very much. You, you can see that they're that they're um, Hellenistic troops basically, and they just have these these shields and stuff. And it, it's not so. Also, as far as the level of training is concerned, I mean, we know that that sometimes Roman Romans were uh, hired, bought, or defected to uh, these these Hellenistic armies to, to instruct. Yeah. And I think it's also cosmetic because it's like, well, you can't have a, a triple line. You can't have, you know, you can't have those formations if you haven't got an army equipped in the same manner. So even if they are, they look like Roman legionaries. They wouldn't operate like Roman legionaries. Um, and you know, even the even the tactics and with Roman advisors, it's like, well, this is what our legionaries do. They throw their pila and then they advance with their gladius. And that's like, well, that's not what we do. <laughs> so um, you know, so what are they? Are they are they light armed troops then? If they throw javelins, um, and then what? And then they're swordsmen. Well, we've got you know, we've got swordsman units and we've got javelin ears. What what's this? What's this hybrid you've created? Um, so, but it clearly works. So we'll have some. You know, it's it's almost a it's almost like this bizarre sort of pick and choose uh, force. Um, but it's not. I don't I don't know the numbers of units, like the size of the unit that's equipped in a Roman manner. But I don't think it's ever meant to be a dominant a dominant f- formation. That remains the phalanx. Yeah, no, I, I don't think the sources are there to say that they were that they were uh, that, that, that there were many of them. Uh, in any case, uh, there must have been just a minority. That's the same impression I have. I've always seen those, uh, you know, those Pontic legionaries by Mithridates. Or, uh, I've always seen them as kind of an exotic element to uh, Hellenistic armies, like uh, elephants or giant ships or something, almost like a like a status symbol, you know. Yeah, we've talked about this in, in previous podcasts as well, that, that the successor armies, that Alexander disappears and, and the, the war machine that he had, basically inherited from Philip, uh, that, the, that all the successor kings basically don't really know how to, how to have it function correctly, the hammer and anvil thing, and then they just start collecting, collecting different types of troops, just putting more in those armies, making them bigger and more varied, and stick some elephants in, why don't we, you know, and just <laughs> doing all this sort of stuff, trying to get these gigantic armies with loads of mercenaries and different types of troops, and native troops from here, and native troops from there, and you've got the, these imitation legionaries and whatever, it's, it's very, uh, very mixed. 
it's almost Herodotian when you when you read the description of um, you know the invading army um, during the Persian Wars. It's like, well, there's these guys who fight with lassos and these guys who fight with that and these guys and they look like this and this is that. And that's very similar, um, you know, again, cyclical. It's because that's what happens in the Hellenistic armies is they suddenly become these sort of fancy cosmetic, um, I would, if I'm going to be incredibly flippant, fashion shows of military style. But um, It's a know. bit like uh, the Ptolemy's uh, take on religious issues in terms of moulding the Greek with the Egyptian and coming up with something new and experimental at the same time and coming up with a god like Serapis which is going to embody the best of everything and we'll put that out there as you know our new you know poster boy as such with to represent our reign. The hedging your bets we've got some of everything we will we'll be able to cope with anything because we have some of everything. Yeah, you got some heavy cavalry. Well, we we've got them too. <laughs> you got camels. We got camels too. Yeah. What's our I've got more than you. I've got more than you. I've got more. I've got more. I'm clearly better. <laughs> yeah. You've got forty thousand men. <laughs> <laughs> I've got fifty-five thousand. Yeah. And I've got reserves. Yeah. <laughs> well, that leads straight into the boats as well. In terms of their ships, it's getting bigger and bigger, and who can actually go the biggest and you know still float as such might not necessarily be a, ne- a great warship that's going to actually take out anything. It just sits out there and, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's like this large wooden island that sort of bobs about yeah. on the waves. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, 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 the theoretical one is, is still like, you know, I was watching that uh, Ancient Impossible one and how big some of those rumoured ships were and whether they even could have ever been built. Um just but you know the the manpower required and the the wood you know let's deforest Lebanon um, as a way of building these ships. The uh, forty that was uh, fielded by uh, Ptolemy later in the third century BC, uh, most modern reconstructions, even theoretical reconstructions, say that it would have been two hulled, that is two twenties, with a big deck, you know, planking it like a catamaran. And uh, Athenaeus of Naucratus, in his uh, Deipnosophistae, he says that it carried 4,000 rowers, 4,000 sailors. So, so those would have been the people to actually you know, work the sails and ropes and what have you. And uh, also would have embarked over 2,800 marines. So my count is that's over 7,000 people on a single ship, which, interestingly enough, is a larger crew than a nuclear-powered Nimitz aircraft carrier. At full, that's remarkable. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about that. Uh, it, the, the, the evidence given by Athenius, Athenaeus, he's deriving it from Calixenus, uh, an earlier-in-time source who would have been contemporary with this 40. Uh, so I, I think it's circumstantial. I think it's believable. Uh, I look at that kind of a ship, and I think it, it, it had to have been, I think, specially built for maybe a single-use purpose. Uh, I, I, just the practical practicalities of using it. How do you not simply launch that, but how do you haul it out of the water? Because uh, all war galleys in the ancient world had to be dried out periodically. And by periodically, the Athenians would do that each evening. Okay, uh, how do you pull out a ship that could have held seven thousand men? Now, did you have seven thousand men pulling it out with cables or something like that? Uh, it must have been very difficult. So probably it was built for, I, I am guessing, okay, uh, a siege of a defended harbor, and I, I don't think it was something that would necessarily have been manned. You know, you know, year in, year out by Ptolemy's navy. That would have been too big. But he had many other extremely large ships that probably were in regular use too. Is there any port that would have been able to actually fit it? I mean... Another practicality, a great question. I, I don't know. Do you, would you have simply pulled that out onto the beach and built your dock works specifically for that? I'm not certain what else would have been able to hold it. It would have been gigantic. Not to mention, you know, one one Mediterranean storm and the whole thing's gone. So, uh, what has been intriguing to me is that uh, the woods used by in, in ordinary galley construction, the the most popular wood to use for triremes was fir. 
Uh, pine was less desirable because it was heavier. Uh, cedar was also used, but that would have been, I guess, in Lebanon and the Seleucid navies. I'm not certain what kind of wood would have been used by the Egyptians for their hull timbers. The advantage of wood is that it was light and strong. However, it would also absorb water very readily, and that's why it had to be, the ship had to be pulled out of the water uh, each day to let it dry out so that you weren't carrying around uh, you know, extra tons of worth of water in your hull. It would have been you know, too heavy and uh, much sl uh, harder to row. Um, I would as assume that all of these bigger ships would have suffered from the same debilitation if they were left in the water. Uh, how, though, do you get these giant ships out, okay? Uh, it it yeah. must have been very difficult, and I'm wondering whether or not this would have been a stable of ships used for very specific purposes, not patrolling, obviously, not, uh, you know, e even showing the flag. More, uh, we're attacking a city. There's a harbor that we have to smash through, and that's what it was. These were like gigantic siege guns, okay? Not yeah, field artillery. I, I, I also wonder whether they are simply either rumors or, or propaganda that, um, you know, this thing is basically unoperational, but it's incredibly impressive. Um, and the, the sort of the rumors of, oh, well, there's, you know, they've got this ship. Uh, which which has massive echoes of, of, of the Cold War and, uh, you know, military parades of like, well, none of the missiles work, but let's put them on on trucks and, and drive them past because that looks really impressive. Um, you you wonder you wonder whether there's that sort of aspect of, of uh, a campaign of, you know, don't go against us and because we've got this, you know, master weapon that will come and it will it will tear down your city walls in a single blow. It's uh, interesting you mention that. And the generally speaking, the it, it has typically been regarded that there are these giant super galleys were one upsmanship at sea. That is, you've got a nine, I am building a ten. You have a ten, I will build a thirteen, a fourteen, what have you. And certainly there may have been a prestige factor in these, but the the reason why I hesitate to simply go for the giganticism for the sake of giganticism argument is that uh, they cost a lot of money. For example, I think it was the uh, Leontophoros of Lysimachus. So we're, we're dealing with a very late 4th century BC. It would have required 1,600 rowers and hundreds of sailors and marines to crew that. That's money. So I would have, I would have assumed that it did something... Uh, of real military value. And uh, William A. Murray, his book, uh, The Age of Titans, I highly recommend it. He says that apart from the prominence of frontal ramming as a tactic in Hellenistic warfare, okay, that is this bow to bow ramming and, you know, you need a bigger ship as a, an advantage in this. Uh, they, there was a real need to attack and defend fortified harbors in the wars of the successors and uh, and if you want to call the Syrian wars, the wars of the successors too between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids, that these big ships had advantages in smashing through whatever the harbor defenses were uh, in, in front of these places and that's why they were built. Uh, it, the So I think that is extremely plausible argument uh, to be made. The problem that we have with the source material, especially for the survey uh, or uh, given of the army, sorry, the uh, fleet of Ptolemy II, Philadelphus, is that the source material for the Syrian wars is really scarce. Uh, we, we know these wars happened, uh, but as W.W. Uh, w. Tarn pointed out, we only have a description of naval battles, real descriptions. Cyprian Salamis in 306 BC, and then the next good description is the Battle of Chios in 201 BC. So we go over a century without any real detailed naval battle. And that makes it a problem to know what exactly all of these big ships did. I, I'm of the inclination, you know, following Murray, that they did something very important.
but what precisely they did and you know how they were used we can't say could they be dual purpose i mean i'm the one that's jumping into mind here is there's a, a i don't know if you'd call it a ship or a you know a bark that uh, Claudius uses to actually transport a it's specially made I understand a obelisk all the way from Egypt to Rome and then of course when they get it to Rome and they start transporting it up the Tiber and whatnot and the bark is no longer of any use they sink it in front of the new harbour and to actually make the the island or the mole out of uh, you know, the foundations for the mole in front of Claudius's new harbour out of that particular vessel I mean Okay, they might not be thinking these things in terms of the, the Ptolemaic ships, but is there possibly another reason why or what they can do with them once they actually attack a city? Could they be being used as, you know, part of, you know, a, a ready-made siege ramp or something? The, the use of uh, galleys as siege units goes back to at least Alexander when he used them against Tyre in uh, 330, uh, sorry, 332. Yeah. And certainly I believe that these big ships were used to attack and, and, and what have you. Uh, they also would have had in a real sea fight that is not merely attacking and defending a harbor, uh, a bigger galley is was very difficult for a smaller galley to... Uh, assault. That is, it was very difficult for people, Marines, let's say, on a smaller galley to get on to the deck of a higher galley. Uh, it, it was just a very difficult thing to do. Uh, why, though, I mean, we're, we're talking why they started building galleys, though, in the 11, 13, 15s, where you would have needed so many rowers and what have you. It's, it's difficult to uh, say... Uh apart from, well, it was bigger and harder to atta attack, uh, it's hard to say what that would have, how that would have been a benefit. It, it, but I think it had to have been some benefit because they were there. Not necessarily going to the extent of the, the 30s and 40s, but going back to sort of the Ptolemy I and Seleucus, uh, during their, their initial wars of the Diadochi, there's the reference, I think, in, what's that, three... 315, I think, to uh, Ptolemy's navy sort of patrolling up and down the Levantine coastline, not really actually engaging any fighting, but rather just sort of showing off to uh, the, the forces, I think, of Eumenes at the time, uh, you know, what he's got as such. Whether they were, you know, he was in any intention of engaging, it doesn't seem likely. There could very well have been uh, an aspect to these big ships that is it was a way of showing demonstrating to a potential foe that i have the capability of attacking your city and taking it and also reassuring your allies that if you are attacked i can come to your defense so there is a deterrent effect possibly with this yep. oh, i think i think that the that means that whether they were capable of actually doing it or not. I mean, what most modern reconstructions of how this thing couldn't have worked. You know, how do you row it? How does it, you know, the speed's going to be tiny. Um, and so that that comes down to it, even though it's expensive in manpower and money and wood, it has a, a worthwhile effect on the morale of your own allies and troops and your enemy that therefore the cost is met by the effect um, even if, even if in reality, it's not actually going to have any practical uh, purpose. It, well, it, it almost sounds like it's, it's going to the Second World War. Some of the actually ludicrous pieces of equipment that the Luftwaffe uh, created, you know, the Gigant and all these sorts of things, which were mm -hmm. they very practical? Probably not, but they made a terrifying effect on a, on an enemy, thinking that, crikey, they can actually ship, you know, whole, whole units with trucks and all this sort of stuff. And even and even the morale the morale on your own troops you know we've got this weapon and you you would be a fool to fight us because we have this uh, and I if, you know certainly the patrolling the the coast aspect has that to it um, so whether you know with, whether they were ever fired in anger um, well if you turn up for a battle with something that's you know everyone else has got you know regular sized shipping and you turn up with one massive thing that sits in the middle um, if that's the last thing standing you've won. <laughs> 
even if everything else has been sunk and that's the unsinkable one, you've won. Yosho mentioned earlier about uh, the, the end of this period we're discussing was really 31, uh, or 30 probably, the, the Cleopatra dying in 30, was the fact that, for example, Actium, it was the play between very large vessels and very small vessels, and it was the small vessels which were tactically more advantageous. And of course, it was Marcus Agrippa learning from Sextus Pompeius in the previous battles of Malapus, where he had actually, he'd had Laburnians, he'd had small ships, but Marcus Agrippa had taken big ships. And he learned that small, agile vessels were actually much more tactically useful. Mm. Um, so they but may look big vessels. Ten deckers may look very impressive for uh, Mark Antony to stand on, but he's still beating. And what's the, I mean, what's the, I think the, is it a 12 that's the largest vessel at Actium on the Egyptian side? So I think it, for all the, the, the these massive ships, they're clearly not effective long term. Um, and the, they, they sort of, they shrink back down. To, to, to still very big ships and certainly much bigger than your, you know, your average trireme. But, um, Once again, it comes down to the battle site conditions. I mean, if you get a storm the night before and the weather's choppy, that's bad. Um, of course, general <laughs> ships, you know, what's very interesting, the Actium was, was, was two very different kinds of general commanding. I mean, a guy that actually had won naval battles and Mark Antony hadn't won anything, pretty much. He was regarded as the greatest military mind of his age and the, the clear successor of Julius Caesar. That's, oh, how nasty of you. And that, that, that he never lived up to that potential just makes him like, you know, the, the disappointing son. But, oh. But, 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 it, but, it, but it's very interesting. So, for example, you know, uh, it, no doubt it might have been a whim by, by this king to, to build this, this boat, and it sounded a great idea at the time. And uh, it might have been like the Gustavus Vasa, you know, I mean, on its, on its inaugural. Uh, sailing, it, it, it didn't kind of live up to the promise, but it made a massive yeah. impact on those, and the legend grew out of it. I was going to say, another one was if you'd seen Game of Thrones this week without giving anything away, there, uh, that, that, well, the, the, well, there's all the ships in the harbour acting as platforms for, uh, for, siege, for siege equipment. Well, see, see, it's exactly that. You see, the game, I mean, for the Game of Thrones thing, it's like, well, I've got dragons. Have you got dragons? No, you haven't got dragons. I've got three dragons. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, yeah, it's, it's a metaphor. The entire Game of Thrones is a metaphor for Hellenistic warfare. Well, I was going to say, you need to keep up it, really, because this week, because Raul on, uh, on uh, Facebook was making uh, other um, references to Game of Thrones and Can I, which uh, Lindsay will understand when he, when he possibly when he watches this mm, week's mm. episode. Well, they were, it was interesting because they, they were talking about they were talking about that. Um, yeah, the directors talked about that, which is just the bizarrest, inaccurate kind of. They wanted to do model Agincourt and Can I, and yet there's no double envelopment and and there's not. Yeah, yeah, just weird, weird kind of really because you could have done it. Oh. Don't just don't speak. There's there's already talk on the internet about how it's the most accurate medieval battle ever portrayed, and you know you're like, oh god, oh god, no, no. It's like, well, it's like, you know, sorry, spoilers, but you know, you've got this really great giant that can punch punch through the walls of a of a fort, but it can't break a shield wall. Come on, come on, people. Wasn't the um, Russell Crowe uh, Robin Hood possibly the most accurate medieval? A uh, piece of warfare ever depicted on film. We 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 don't we don't discuss that film. We don't talk with the, about with, the, it. with those ye olde worldy uh, landing craft where the fronts came down like the, oh, the Higgins boats. Oh god! Oh god! <laughs> and the you can tell me that Versailles is actually historically correct. It's so bizarre. I mean, it's it's one of those strange things that the expectations of film viewers and what film producers expect or think film viewers want to see. Um, and it's like, well, it wouldn't take much to make it accurate, and yet you you just don't. And it would actually, in many cases, be less expensive because you wouldn't have a pyrotechnics budget. But but, but the the peculiar thing was um, watching you know these big ships with siege weapons on. I kind of almost thought well, that's if you didn't know otherwise, it was all it's almost fantastical. Yeah, uh, which clearly it's not. Well, especially with oh, their especially with their their burning their burning payload. It's like, well, that's a big risk. In a ship, and it's also—I mean, it's—it's it's a strange thing. This idea that everything that the 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 medieval and the ancient war flung into the air had to be had to be lit. You know, a, a ruddy great stone being thrown at your walls is as effective if it's not burning. Because but you can't gonna... see a stone flying through the air, so it's pointless in a visual medium. But it, but in many ways, it makes it more effective. You know, because you can't see it. I mean, we. Oh. There were actually flying fire brands 
Um, because as I remember, the young Octavius is actually, uh, you know, brief, briefing his uh, commander Agrippa, says, don't, don't resort to that because I actually want Antony's ships. And unfortunately, mm. what happens, the battle degrades down to this, kind of, shall we say, a thermo, a thermo fire war. And um, you know, it's, that, that's what happens, massive losses all around. Tricky, tricky. Because, you know, I think that with, with the, um, you know, fire they have to resort to modern technology to make it burn when it's flying through the air because most other things that they try extinguish themselves in flight. We only have like a pot with oil. I didn't know that olive oil burned like that, but okay, that was naphtha maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we, know they, we know they had burning technology, but... Um, well, didn't yeah, the Persians was... experiment a bit with it in terms of um, petroleum? Yeah, and the, the bitumen. Um, so hmm. m- m- moving on to more current affairs... Um, uh, not, not to make it not to make it a political statement, uh, and especially you know, considering the referendum here in the UK. But in Arnold Bloomberg's article, he states, due to internal factors such as the establishment of the Greek soldier farming and trading settlements throughout the country, uh, the Egyptian economy grew and diversified in fields of agriculture and industry, with increasing intermarriage between Greek or Macedonian soldiers, settlers, and the local Egyptian populace. Politically, an economic privilege and opportunity grew and was spread to far more people than was the case before this pattern occurred. So, were the Greeks and Egyptians better together? Or, as Facebook Stuart says, why did the P- 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 Ptolemaic dynasty? F- uh, flourish I think because of the stability of Ptolemaic rule and the isolation of Egypt from the remainder of the, the, the Hellenistic kingdoms because of the, uh, the surrounding desert and I think also the great wealth of the Nile and, and Egypt as a whole it's, it's an incredibly fertile and wealthy part of the world and it remains so you know, it's, it, it remains Rome's major source of grain after Rome takes over Egypt for, for, for vast amounts of time. And, and a major, some... major source for uh, scientific progress and that sort of stuff as well. I mean, Heron of Alexandria is a, is a prime example of, of that, of, of, of what happens when you mix all these different cultures together and you just let them simmer, basically. One thing that the Romans certainly did, I would imagine the, the, the Greeks coming in, was they were able to basically leverage the existing bureaucracy didn't replace it. They kind of used it. It was there. It functioned. Um, and they respected the, the pecking order, the, you know, the, the tiers of all the officials and demi-officials and clerics and all the rest of it. And uh, uh, with a small number of, I guess, Im- uh, immigrants, as they would have represented, could leverage a great deal of progress. As long as the organization was able to trickle down the instructions and make them work, you, you could get a lot done. They also deflect a lot of the warfare away from Egypt. They promote warfare in Greece, in Macedon, up in you know in Turkey, uh, across into the Seleucid Empire. It's anywhere but their own shores. It, it, you know, as far as possible, they can make it, um, and you know they do this by you know going on the offensive. At some times, they at other times they're actually committing you know, financial resources to make sure they're promoting that warfare elsewhere. So it, it is deflecting that, it, that you know, activity away from their, their home territory. Yeah, Egypt isn't ravaged by war um, until the very end of the Hellenistic period. Right, chaps, let's, um, let's leave it there. I'd like to thank Joshua, Murray, Lindsay, Mark and Mark and Sean. Uh, don't forget, if you want to leave us questions, you can find us on Facebook um ancient warfare magazine and the history network uh we usually put up a call for questions a few days before we're about to record so keep your eyes peeled i'm angus wallace and thanks for listening